In a previous video, we talked about references and borrowing in Rust. So if you don't know what references and borrowing are in Rust, you can check the previous video. If you know more or less what references and borrowing are, this is the video for you because we'll dive deep into a very interesting concept in Rust, which is lifetimes. Lifetimes is a concept that might be hard to understand at the beginning because we don't have another programming language that has a similar concept. So we need to check the examples and really try to understand how the Rust compilers thinks and works in order to write efficient code in Rust. Rust. We will make many examples, so no worries. Let's start and let's see if I can explain you what lifetimes in Rust are. Let's talk about lifetimes in Rust. This is not a concept present in other programming languages, so please pay attention and if you have any question, just drop them below. Lifetimes in Rust are a tool to ensure memory safety and they are a way to tell the compiler that references are still valid for a certain amount of time. And we can consider them as a type of generic. This is why they are in this section of the course. We saw traits last lesson and generics two lessons ago. Let's get started. Let's see a simple example. And the main goal of lifetimes is to prevent dangling references. Let's see it here. We have this simple function main. We define a variable on line 15. And then in an inner scope, we define another variable. And then we create a reference to this variable. In this lesson, we will talk about lifetimes, which is an evolution of that previous lesson about borrowing and references in Rust. What is the problem here? We can already see something on line 19, but let's try to type cargo run. Let's read the, the error. It's a bit strange. X does not live long enough. Borrowed value does not live long enough. The problem is that X will be out of scope and then we will use this again. You can see here X dropped here while still borrowed on line 20 in this inner scope, but then here we are using this uh, variable again below. And R is still valid because uh, we declared this uh, on line 15. Before we proceed, a uh, quick note. I told you that in Rust uh, there is no null value, which is a bit strange for a programming language. And you might think, uh, how can Rust uh, understand that this value is null here? Because on line 15 we just declared the variable R. And the thing is that we have an error at compile time. This is why Rust doesn't need a null value. It just throws an error at compile time. Rust has something called the borrow checker, and I made a small example here on how the borrow checker works. You can see we have this A and this B. And as you can see, the B block is much smaller than the A block. It's like inside this A block. The program is rejected here because B is shorter than A. The subject of the reference doesn't live as long as the reference itself. To fix our code, we should do something like this, where x that has this uh, scope b is bigger than a. So r will always be valid when x is valid. Let's try to run this again, cargo run, and now everything works as intended. Now that we understood the logic behind lifetimes, let's see this in a practical example and let's see generic lifetimes in functions. We have a function main here and a function longest that returns the longest between two strings given as parameters. And see here on line 22, there is the declaration of this function. If x len is greater than y len, return x, otherwise y. This is, code is just an example, of course. Uh, so let's try to run this code, cargo run, and we have another error. Missing lifetime specifier. Why? Because uh, we don't know which of these two pieces of code will be executed. We don't know if the value will be x or y with this uh, syntax. And you see here the compiler is also 
suggesting the syntax we should use. So let's add these generic lifetimes in this function. In the previous example, we managed to fix the code writing this in a different way. But here we really don't know if we will go in this scope X or Y. So there is no solution here unless we use lifetimes. So let's use this lifetime annotation syntax. It's already here. We need to change line 24. The syntax is similar to generics. We see we have these uh, angular brackets and we can use the apostrophe and then any letter we want. Usually you use A. We can use any letter we want with an apostrophe before that. For example, a simple A. We also need to add this here. The syntax is a bit weird but uh, we will get used <laughs> to it. So on here in the definition of the function close to the name then on the parameter x parameter y and also in the return type okay and now the code should compile let's type cargo run and now it's uh, working and it's also returning the um, right result. This uh, function signature now is handling the reference to the block X or block Y when we are returning here this uh, print statement correctly. We just implemented our very first example with lifetimes. Check line 24. This is uh, what you need to get familiar with. Now let's see another example that shows that the lifetime of the reference in a result must be the smaller lifetime of the two arguments. Check the changes on line 18 to 21. You see it's already complaining. If we type cargo run here, we have this error. String 2 does not live long enough. Forward value does not live long enough. It's talking about uh, this. You see string 2 dropped here while still borrowed. So as humans here, we know that in this case, the string 1 is the right one, is the longest one, but the compiler doesn't know this at compile time. It can check that this string is longer. This can also be an argument, uh, an external input. So the Rust compiler can't rely and do a real check here. So it's trying to use the string 2, which is in an inner scope. And in this case, it fails, even if it will not use it in this specific case. This is very important to understand. Now, let's start thinking in terms of lifetimes. And the way in which you need to specify the lifetime parameters depends on what the function is actually doing. We should not put lifetimes everywhere now just because we just learned them. For example, let's say that I keep the function name as longest, but I always return the first string here the x1. In this case, for example, we don't need to specify a lifetime for a parameter that will not be used by the function. This is just, of course, an example. Now let's check this other example, because this is uh, interesting. Let's say that uh, I define this function with lifetimes, I define parameters without lifetimes, but I put a lifetime as a return type. You can see here on line 25, this one. And I just return a hard-coded string. So now this should work because uh, you're just defining a string here and returning the string. No, it's not working. Cargo run. The problem is that uh, if I'm using lifetimes, I should use them correctly. So if I'm using a lifetime annotation in the return type, this should match at least one of the types uh, given as uh, parameters. So since we don't, we are not using any lifetimes here, the compiler is throwing an error. Even if this is just a hard-coded string and I want to just, you know, return a basic string. So if you are using lifetimes, you should use them correctly and the lifetime annotation should be in at least one parameter or more. This is very important to understand. You can also use lifetimes annotations in struct definitions. If you want to know more about structs, there are many lessons in this course. We can define a struct with the name and we see it's very similar to generics. We use this um, apostrophe annotation and then we define this part uh, ampersand apostrophe a. And in this case, the lifetime of the important excerpt struct on line 21 will be the same as the lifetime of the first sentence variable on line 20. They are tied together in this case.
And now you might be very confused because uh, you can say, hey, Francesco, but we never used the lifetimes so far with all these functions. Why are we introducing it just now on the 26th, 27th lesson? Because in the previous versions of Rust, developers had to annotate with the lifetimes all the functions. Instead, now the compiler is smarter, so you don't need to add lifetimes for some patterns that the compiler can recognize. So basically, the compiler will add the lifetimes annotations with you if you use some famous pattern. And for example, we use it in different ways here on line 29, 34, 37. But the annotation of this FN first word function should look like this one. I wrote this on line 25. So check line 25 and check line 13. Do you agree that line 13 is way easier? But this is just an elision to make the life of developers easier. The compiler will still have something like this with this kind of lifetime annotations, both for the parameter and the return type here for this first word. Three rules for lifetimes. Number one, each parameter that is a reference gets its own lifetime parameter. Number two, if there is exactly one input lifetime parameter, that lifetime is assigned to all output lifetime parameters. We saw an example some time ago. And number three, if there are multiple input lifetime parameters, but one of them is at self or at mutable self, because this is a method, in this case, the lifetime of self is assigned to all output lifetime parameters. Can we use uh, lifetime annotations in method definitions? Well, methods are functions, so the short answer is yes. We see an example here. Check, for example, line 13 and 14. We have a struct with the lifetime A on this field art. And then we have uh, impl, square brackets, apostrophe A, important excerpt A. And here we have this method level with ampersand self. And notice that we, here we don't need to add the apostrophe because of Elysium. So this is, the compiler will understand that here we are using lifetime and this is a recognized pattern. We are almost done. I want to mention a static lifetime. So it's not recommended, but we can define a variable that will live for the whole duration of the program using this syntax. For example, let s ampersand apostrophe static string. Okay, don't do this if you don't know what you are doing, because in this case, we are using a lot of memory. We are at the end of this section. Before we wrap up, I want to make an example that uses generics as type parameters, trait bounds, and lifetimes all together. We are using here the display for the standard library. We have a function longest with an announcement here that uses together annotation of lifetimes and generics with three arguments, x, y, and an, which stands for announcement. The announcement is a generic. X and Y, they're annotated with the lifetime annotation. And you see the output is also an, a string with a lifetime annotation, line 30. We have a where clause. Check the previous lessons for that. And then we print the announcement using a logic similar to what we saw in the previous example. And then in the main function, we define two strings, string 1 and string to, we have a result that uses this function longest with an announcement, and then it prints the longest string returned by this function. Let's try it out. Cargo run. And here we can see the longest string is ABCD, but above that we have also a custom announcement. In this case, it's just a string, but that's a generic. We could also return a number or something else. So this is the end of this lesson and this has been very interesting and we are getting into more advanced concepts. I remind you that generics, traits, and lifetimes, they are not to complicate the way we code, but to avoid code repetition. The goal here is to make our code reusable and prone to errors. Good luck in writing your Rust code and if you have any question, just drop it below. Bye.